build a record, the official record today, uh, and a transcript we can transmit as well uh, over to the process at CDFA. Uh, I can tell you that the original purpose was to evaluate the sufficiency of the environmental impact report uh, as drafted by CDFA. So this is kind of the first note of, first, let's look at the EIR process and let's look at the document itself and try to get some understanding of the eradication uh, methods as proposed in the EIR. Uh, I can tell you that this committee does have oversight over CDFA. Uh, we had lots of questions regarding the EIR as produced by the department and some related policy questions, big policy questions on eradication efforts in the, in the totality in California. However, we were informed by CDFA that uh, they have been counseled against participating in today's hearing, uh, citing concerns about potential litigation uh, regarding the EIR process itself. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we always keep in mind uh, when we have threats of litigation that are some, in some sense, some determining uh, factor in the course of where government moves. <coughs> but I can tell you that uh, it's certainly true uh, when that threat serves to limit conversations uh, between government. That's disappointing when we can't have a dialogue between the agency that puts out an EIR that is ultimately the decision maker of the EIR and we have an oversight committee uh, in the legislature whose job it is to oversee the actions of that agency and they, uh, in essence, uh, hide behind the veil of litigation. Uh, I can't tell you, I've been in this legislature uh, in and out since 1987, that's 20 plus years, and we've always found a way uh, to have folks testify and they simply have to say in many cases, uh, I'm not privy to speak on that point, uh, and we move on to other questions. That didn't occur today, it's very disappointing. Uh, I believe, as you, most of you know, that government should be open and transparent and true dialogue should occur, particularly in the halls of this capital. And I do believe that holds true for the EIR process itself. The EIR process should be as transparent as any. Uh, and so to have that discussion here today would have served a crucial, uh, would have been a great process to have as this EIR is now out. Uh, I can also tell you that uh, the would, we will continue to monitor uh, the EIR process. We will continue to monitor CDFA, CDFA activities as it relates to LBAM, and we will not hesitate to hold further hearings in order to hear from CDFA, CDFA in terms of its final action. So let me just notice right now, on September 28th, uh, when uh, all is said and done and EIR is closed and CDFA is about to make its decision, we will have a hearing prior to that because we still want to understand you know, what it is that the Secretary is going to be looking at in terms of judging all of the comments before it and what he found <coughs> that had value and what he felt uh, may have not been uh, valid. And I think that's important prior to a decision. So we're going to go through this exercise one more time uh, with CDFA. We thought uh, this would be a good venue uh, as indeed they are out taking uh, public comment uh, throughout California. Uh, I can tell you that um, uh, getting some public comment today, again, will be extremely important. Uh, we look forward to getting your comments on the record, and we would, of course, would like to submit that as the official record of a Senate uh, Food and Ag Committee hearing. Uh, do note it in this capital and forward that on to the Secretary and the Department of Food and Ag. So with that, let's go ahead and begin, um, if we could, with uh, panel one, and we'd like to have uh, Roy Upton, and uh, Dr. Daniel Harder, uh, Dr. James Perry, and Daryl Chambers. Uh, if you could all please come up. Okay. And however order you'd like to proceed, of course, um, we would like to uh, start in the order that you would uh, like to move on. And then we'll call up some more folks as we move on. I guess I'll jump in uh, so you can say thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Uh, my name is Roy Upton. I represent a Citizens uh, Public Health and Environmental Organization known as Citizens for Health. Uh, we have 90,000 members nationwide, 8,500 members in California. When we initially opposed the, the aerial spray, it was based on a philosophical basis that human population should not be sprayed with untested pesticides, especially for a, an alleged problem that had not yet been established, i.e. like brown apple. 
between the various cities that were sprayed, uh, there was a potential explosion to uh, 1.2 million people between Monterey and Santa Cruz. And CDFA proposes to do this for three or four days every month uh, for up to six or seven years. It would take several years in order to do this. Um, they were also proposing to do this in the entire Bay Area and many cities in California, outside of Santa Cruz and Monterey. Within literally within days of the spraying, the first spraying in Monterey, we tried to receive uh, phone calls and emails regarding human adverse events. Um, this included a near fatality of another month of a named Jack Wilcox in Monterey, uh, who had never had respiratory problems before. And within uh, the next day, the very next day after the spray, he started developing respiratory symptoms. And by the third day after the spray, had him admitted to the emergency room with uh, severe respiratory failure. Literally, his eyes rolling back into his head and almost dying. And not one person from the state or from the county ever contacted uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wilcox to talk about their son. Uh, several other children in Santa Cruz and Monterey experienced similar, but not as, as potentially fatal reactions as did Jack. Uh, literally on the environmental side, seabirds literally were drowning and dying uh, by the droves, washing up on the beaches around Santa Cruz, starting on the very morning after the spring. Um, dead land birds were being found in people's backyards. One gentleman in Santa Cruz reported 30 of them uh, just in his neighborhood. He'd lived at Pleasure Point for 30 years, never seen anything like that, but within two days after the spray, these land birds were all over his neighborhood dead without any other reason. Uh, people in Monterey lost, lost dogs and cats, goats. Uh, one woman who raised rabbits in Monterey lost entire litters. That had never happened in 20 years of her raising rabbits, literally the morning after the spray. All of these were from unexplained causes. Now, most of these were un- investigated except for the birds. The official cause of death of the seabirds uh, was red tide. Uh, but the same yellow, greenish, oily stuff that was on the dead seabirds was also on some of the pets that were exposed or in people's planter boxes on their decks or their cars. So we have no idea how red tide could have ever gotten into people's backyards. But this was the official cause of death given uh, for the seabirds. Uh, within a few weeks, we had gathered more than 450 human adverse events, mostly respiratory in nature, which would be predictable from the aerial spray. And we reported at least 650 dead seabirds. And that was actually the official state tally, uh, 650. And when you look at the scientific literature, when you find 650, that's usually representing only 10% of what actually occurred. That is what's not found, the dead ones are not found. Again, I highlight these because contrary to popular opinion, according to this EIR, the aerial spraying is not off the table. They've said they've limited aerial spraying to uh, rural areas, but most of us live in rural areas. My niece and nephew and their new baby live in rural areas. This is not acceptable to us. Farm workers live and work in rural areas. This is still not acceptable to us. Citizens for Health is also a science-based organization. We try very hard to determine whether or not there is a cause for our philosophical belief in whether these problems should be opposed or supported. And regarding LBM, we contacted LBM experts worldwide, in Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, United Kingdom, anywhere where LBM was endemic or naturalized, uh, we found people in farms, entomologists, government officials in forestry, and in agriculture. The response we got was almost unanimous. Why are you asking us about such an insignificant insect? This is not a big problem to us. Um, a few months back when CDFA alleged uh, damage to raspberries in Watsonville, um, they said 20% of to 50% of their crop was lost. We contacted raspberry growers in Australia and New Zealand and again, unanimously the comment was, this is no problem to us in raspberries whatsoever. We can talk about other pests, but not Elbin with regards to the raspberries. Don't wait. One reviewer actually said, don't waste your time calling anyone else. They'll tell you the same exact thing. The biggest thing that we brought to the table is we reviewed uh, published literature that made any reference to Elbin going back for more than 70 years. Uh, it was, again, consistent. Elbin is a very minor insect that only becomes a pest of significance when pesticides are used excessively and destroy the natural predators that would typically keep Alabama at bay. This is consistent throughout the literature. 
There was also a relative consensus that even when Alabama populations are high, you rarely see any damage that's done to any crop. And this is similar to the many native leaf rollers that we already have in, in California. They, they're superficial. Uh, their damage that they do is transient. It's minimal, it's very rare, sometimes or most of the time non-existent and easily managed in agricultural systems. So little economic and biological consequence contrary to what we've been told. Uh, government officials and representatives of fruit growing organizations in those same countries stated that they neither had any problem managing out there nor shipping their products internationally. And this is the basic premise of the EIR that we will lose revenues because we can't ship our products, but this is not a problem for any country where Alabama is endemic. We also contacted people in Hawaii where Alabama has been since at least 1896. They never, until the USDA quarantines were issued in 2007, never had any problem with shipping anywhere in the world uh, due to Alabama, and they never had a fine of Alabama in any crop, uh, nor were they ever quarantined for any Alabama in a crop, nor um, did any farmer ever report any damage to any crop due to Alabama, and there's never been a report of any damage to native forests or native flora due to Alabama. And again, this is all contrary to what we're told by CFA. Uh, this statement actually is confirmed by USDA um, records that show that in New Zealand, 99.9% .9 of their produce can be shipped to the U.S. despite having very strict quarantines against Alabama, which means that they easily manage it as a crop quality issue, and that's where we think this should go, is as a crop quality issue. Right now, a $3 million ad campaign is telling Californians California, that Alabama threatens our food supply, our precious redwoods, oaks, and cypresses, and even our way of life. This is what the ads are saying. We reviewed no, numerous formal insect population surveys of Alabama in forests or insects in forests where Alabama is naturalized, including all the countries that I mentioned before. And again, not one of those surveys lists Alabama as any kind of problem to native flora, though again they tell us that this is going to wipe out our redwoods and our cypresses and oaks and even endangered species in the United States. Uh, we contacted horticultural experts and officials in those countries. Again, the response was exactly the same. LVM, to our knowledge, has never been a problem in any of our native forests, and this is even in New Zealand and Australia where LVM is native. Natural predators keep LVM at bay, and there's no risk and no threat to native flora whatsoever. Two California courts ruled that there was no evidence of emergency due to LVM that USDA or CDFA could produce in justifying their emergency. They came to this legislature saying that there was a dire emergency associated with LVM and that they needed to do something very quickly because they only had a small window in which they could eradicate LVM. They said at that time that window was three to six months. Now it's up until 2015. Three years ago, USDA's Alabama Technical Working Group believed that LBAM could be eradicated from California, but their opinion was predicated on three basic principles. One, that LBAM was a recent introduction and that current populations were very small and localized. Two, that eradication was justified based on projected crop damage and restriction of markets due to trade quarantines. And three, establishing that LBAM would result in an increased use of pesticides in agriculture and home use. Those were the premises on which the LBAM Technical Working Group of USDA said that LBAM could and should be eradicated. Well, three eight years later, we know there's no support for any of these points, none at all. What CDFA has not told this legislature and the California public is that LBAM is not a recent introduction to the US. USDA has been intercepting LBAM at points of entry into the US since 1984. What they also have not told this legislature is that at the time that the TWG meeting occurred, according to trapping data of CDFA, there was only a single find in 1,441 traps. And TWG members didn't have any idea that in reality, millions of Alabama occupied a span of 23,000 miles across California, which is where it is today. And CDFA will tell you that Alabama populations are increasing and spreading 
But that's not really the case. What's really spreading is their trapping program. The more traps they put in more places, the more LBAM they find. It's not that LBAM is growing. Their trapping program is becoming more efficient. The TWJG, the Technical Working Group, specifically noted that the feasibility and probability of a successful eradication was greatly lessened if there were significant expansion of the known infested areas. At that time, they knew that LBAM existed in Santa Cruz County and in San Francisco County. They didn't know that it was across 15 different counties in California. Thus, the original premise that eradication could succeed because LBAM was a recent introduction or based on existence of very small and localized populations is no longer supported. We know that three years in hindsight. As evidenced by international trade of products from Australia, the European Union, Hawaii, New Zealand, the UK, LBAM is easily and cost effectively managed as a crop quality issue in those countries and it's that the USDA quarantines that are hurting California farmers not really LBAM. Regarding the other premise, home use of pesticides, before the USDA started the $3 million campaign just recently, people at home had no idea that they had to be afraid of the little moths that were flitting around in their light bulbs. Now, if home pesticide use increases, it'll be not because of LBAM, but because USDA and CDFA have put the fear of this moth of mass destruction into the minds of Californians who think they have to take a can of Raid and spray their porch lights. Now there are many specific criticisms we can highlight with the EIR itself and we'll do this in written comments. However, the fact that the very premise for the Alabama eradication program is lacking makes all else meaningless in our opinion. One thing this committee should know that the company hired to conduct this independent environmental review, which is NTRIX, publicly stated that they would be getting most of the information for this environmental impact review directly from CDFA. I don't know how that constitutes an independent review, but it does not constitute that for us. There is no independence in this review whatsoever in our opinion. Now in conclusion, Citizens for Health would like to formally ask this legislation to consider the following. One is to convene an oversight hearing to give the public and independent scientists a forum to present a broader representation of the science than has been allowed thus far. Two is to have the California legislature commission its own independent review of LBAN and eradication feasibility through the University of California system. If we have to raise funds in order to do this, we will in the public. That's what we've been told thus far, that California has no money. We'll go out and get it if we can and if we need to. Three, request from USDA, the LBAM Technical Working Group, their formal opinion of whether they continue to believe that LBAM can biologically be eradicated from California, considering its occupation over 23,000 square miles, and to provide documentation if they believe that it can still be eradicated. I'll tell you now that I, I would be willing to bet that most of those members no longer feel it can be eradicated, but they haven't been asked that opinion for at least two years to our knowledge. Four requests from CDFA precise numbers of how much actual economically significant crop damage has occurred in California, not by the USDA quarantines, but directly and conclusively linked with LBAN damage itself. You will find none. In one field in, the, in Watsonville, you will find three berries that may have been eaten by LBAM out of millions of berries, and that's it. And lastly, direct CDFA to cease all participation in the LBAM eradication program. No labor, no general funds, no infrastructure, not even another photocopy. If this is an important enough program for USDA, let them take it over. Let them take over the management, the administration, and the implementation of the program. And if they do, we'll take the fight to them in Washington and leave you guys alone here. In closing, I want to say thank you, appreciation for the opportunity to be able to present our views here. I'm happy to field any questions that you might have, and I'm ready to defend any position or point that we've made today, or if USDA were to challenge anything, I can provide documentation of everything that I've stated today, and we're glad to do that. So thank you. I have some questions for the panel after, but let's keep moving. <coughs> Yes, I want to thank the uh, chair of the committee for allowing us an opportunity to um, speak.
speak on this issue. Um, this is a professional and personal issue for me, and I followed it from the beginning. I'm disappointed that once again CDFA is selected not to attend a public hearing on ELBA. They claim that they welcome an open and honest debate on the scientific foundations of the program from the beginning, yet we have never been given the opportunity to, uh, uh, they've never given us the opportunity to receive answers to our many questions. Based on my knowledge of the literature, first-hand experience with LBAM and leaf blowers in California and in New Zealand, and having conversations with many scientists with decades of experience with LBAM in New Zealand and Australia, I conclude, one, that the justifications for eradicating LBAM from California have not been presented or supported by the science or modern experience. Two, there is little chance that LBAM could be eradicated by any method that is already naturalized in California and its known distribution is widespread, as Roy mentioned, 23,000 square miles over 15 different California counties. And three, there's no need to eradicate the LBAM for, in California, as it's considered a, a minor pest of little concern and consequence. Modern methods exist to effectively control LBAM in agriculture to zero tolerance levels to meet any export or distribution requirements. The collections of the University of California Santa Cruz Arboretum, which I'm the director of, are, are unrivaled in the U.S. For, for its size and diversity of plants from Australia and New Zealand, uh, where Alabama is native and where it's been introduced. For more than 45 years, leaf rovers have been have been controlled there, have not been have, we have not tried to control them there, and we've never had enough damage to warrant any kind of pesticide application for any leaf roll, including uh, like brown Avalon. When looking at the draft EIR and the charge of, the, of, of my testimony uh, to look and assess the, uh, the adequacy of the draft EIR, one of the, one of the public's main concerns and requests were for CDFA to clearly show and present evidence in supporting the necessity to eradicate LBAM. CDFA has never provided a review of the literature nor presented evidence regarding the threat posed by light brown apple moth. The need, for the need for eradication and the likelihood that eradication can succeed. The entire premise for the program has not been provided by CDFA, and what has been provided is based on speculation without scientific reference or peer review. The draft EIR states repeatedly that the light brown apple moth is spreading in California. There is no proof to this statement since trapping only began recently, and to track, <clears throat> to track spread, comparable annual information is necessary. Trapping by CDFA and USDA is simply uncovering existing populations, as Roy stated. Trapping shows that LBAM is widespread in California and confirms this. The draft EIR continues the misinformation regarding LBAM and its damage in agricultural and natural forests overstating and focus on recent minor damage and using this minor outbreak involving LBAM and native leaf rollers as propaganda. There simply is no report of damage from LBAM to native forests in the draft EIR anywhere in the world, and the draft EIR relies on speculation alone to make this claim. Just because LBAM can host on a plant does not mean LBAM can ever decimate it. The no program alternative is based on the premise that private landowners will increase the use of pesticides due to LBAM, causing more environmental damage than the proposed treatments. This no program alternative is, is fear-mongering and based solely on internal memos by a CDFA staffer and the, happens to be the LBAM program manager, Robert Dahl, and who is also a preparer of the draft EIR. This, these memos are not peer-reviewed and they could contain unsubstantiated claims and very few references. Our petition to reclassify the light brown apple moth provides, a comprehensive, provides the comprehensive review of the literature and modern consideration of its effective management. CDFA relies on, on their own scientists and publications, many by CDFA personnel, to justify the policy for eradication while science and the, and the experience in California and worldwide continues to verify that LBAM remains a minor pest and is easy to control. It is also impossible to eradicate if there is no need to eradicate it. The entire program of CDFA is not based on science, only speculation built upon speculation. CDFA credibility is damaged and is diminishing as, as they continue to falsely promote the LBAM eradication program. 
growers knowing that hell bend was a crop quality issue. And, and, there, and are under extensive pressure and do not speak out because of the, the imposed quarantines and the restrictions that are, are being caused by the program. CDFA needs to be trusted because there are other pests that will arrive here and that will they need to be dealt with in a, in a, in a way that controls them. And this, these control programs need to have public support. There's very little self public support for the Light Bionic Moth program. The Light Bionic Moth is not one of these pests. I also think that the UC can provide necessary independent review and analysis of potential pests and advice to CDFA. CDFA claims a willingness and effort to be open and inclusive, but in reality are exclusionary, not available, and not willing to engage the public and address views critical of their own. It is interesting to note this be their behavior when the science does not support their conclusions and actions in what has become a program wasteful of taxpayer money. Thank you very much for the opportunity to afford the questions. Thank you. Let's go on to Dr. James Carey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to uh, testify this morning. Just as background, I'm a professor of entomology at UC Davis. I've been involved with uh, exotic pests since 1980 when I first was appointed as faculty. And uh, I served on the CDFA Medfly Scientific Advisor Panel from 1987 through uh, the mid-90s, along with Dr. Chambers to my right here. I uh, published uh, and organized workshops on invasive biology and, and published uh, a whole uh, collection of articles on that and also uh, a paper on re uh, revisiting eradication uh, with some of the most prominent uh, invasive biologists uh, in the country. So let me uh, set the stage by briefly reviewing the status of Elvin. As my colleagues here on the panel have uh, noted, the known distribution in California is uh, 15 counties and 23,000 square miles. There's every reason to believe, indeed, I believe certainly, that the distribution of LBAM really is uh, in every county in the state. And in light of this uh, biological reality, LBAM should be viewed less as an invasion in progress and more as an invasion that is completed. It follows, then, that to consider eradicating this pest is to consider eradicating what is effectively a resident insect, not unlike any number of exotic residents raising from uh, cabbage moth to bark beetles. Now, as I see it, the central problem with the EIR follows from the reality of this LBAN invasion and the uh, state's proposal to eliminate it completely, that is eradicated. I consider a fatal flaw of this EIR that is based on the erroneous assumption that eradication is possible. Nowhere in the document do they address, much less provide evidence for this assumption. It's difficult for me to overstate the, uh, the difficulty of eradicating a pest that is as widespread and as intrinsic as that. Eradication programs are not unlike military operations. They have checkpoints for preventing movement of material, the application of control tools known to be effective, none of which are, uh, we have that are effective, the ability to monitor uh, populations at extremely low levels, uh, measures put into place to prevent reintroduction, and so forth. A program that was honestly concerned with eradicating this pest would be honest to itself and acknowledge the enormity of this uh, mission. Now, here's the issues with the EIR. First, contrary to what is stated, there is no precedent for eradication of any moth species anywhere in the world. Uh, the pink bullworm they cite is cited there as well as the cotton moth in British Columbia. These are notwithstanding. Indeed, indeed, both of these programs are controlled uh, and not eradication. They simply have not been successful. Second, contrary to what's implied in the EIR, the moss landing facility production uh, will not even be remotely close to what would be needed to have a chance of eradication. That's even conceding that SIT would be effective, which I don't concede. Now, even if S the third, even if SIT was effective, there's no way to eradicate simultaneously in all these areas. This is a huge undertaking. Therefore, you end up with this endless cycle of population reduction in one area, and then you go to the next, and uh, you have a resurgence in the one you just left, and so forth. It's just a cycle. They cannot uh, 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 engage all of these areas in eradication simultaneously, and so you end up with this uh, reintroduction uh, problem. And the fourth uh, issue here, too, is the criteria for declaring eradication is based on political expediency, and not on biological reality. This idea that eradication is achieved after three generations of non-captures regardless of pest biology, the effectiveness of the monitoring tool or the seasonality is really 
biologically ridiculous. Now, the recommendation uh, I would have for this EIR is the CDFA uh, be made to uh, or ask to uh, add an addendum that contains an honest, and scientifically based, and vetted account in which the following questions are addressed. What is the precedent for eradicating LDAM? Uh, two, what is the likelihood of success based on entomologist views and with detailed explanations of why? Third, what is the definition of success? And fourth, given that eradication concept is time limited, otherwise it's control, at what point have they decided that it's no longer feasible? This should be vetted by objective scientists familiar with the principles of invasive biology and have no ties to CDFA. And let me just close, too, uh, with um, a uh, mention of a, a policy paper that I just re read about in science, uh, the journal Science uh, last week. And this is Science for Policy Project. It's uh, an advisory board is uh, uh, Senators George Mitchell, Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, and Rob Dole. And it uh, uh, is regarding um, how to uh, couple some of the uh, science and uh, the, the policy itself. It seemed like this would be um, required reading uh, for this uh, uh, committee as well as CDFA. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since you have no representation from APHIS or USDA or CDFA, maybe I can stand in for them because that's my lifetime. I have 45, all going on 50 years of work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture as an agricultural research service and APHIS researcher. And about 40 years um, of um, a relationship with CDFA in, in providing uh, direction, advice, and consultation on, on precisely this kind of program. And I have to say that I have very high regard for CDFA in the way it, it developed those programs. And I'm primarily talking about the MedFly and some of those, uh, some of those uh, efforts. And, and so I'm here to tell you that I'm extremely disappointed as a professional in this uh, line of work. Yeah, in, in is what essentially a, a, a smoke and, and mirrors um, effort to, to conduct a program that is in no way what it purports to be. Um, you've already heard that the bug um, is distributed beyond the veil of the eradication. You've already heard that it's really not a problem anywhere that it's, that it's been well established or is endemic. Um, and um, so I want to tell you that uh, the technologies of pheromone application and sterile insect technique as, to, as reported to be applied here cannot work. They would not have worked uh, when it was a small, if, if it had been found as a small infestation in Zachary's. At the time they found it, it wasn't a small infestation in Zachary's. It was all over the place, but they, they uh, told us that it was still early and it could be eradicated. There are, there's such a list of reasons why um, pheromones applied in this way um, can, cannot work. That, uh, uh, it's beyond uh, the time I have to tell you, but um, the uh, uh, the bottom line for me here is is that it's not about the technology and it's not about the distribution and it's not about the biology that most disturbs me. Let me let me give you an example of what's going on here for APHIS. Um, I was part of a team that went to China to help to convince the Chinese that our program for MEDFLY of combination of pheromone and attracted some trapping and suppression was adequate to, um, to allow the Chinese to accept California citrus. What was going on really was the Chinese wanted to trade um, some of their products for our citrus. Is, this is an issue about trade. It's not an issue about eradication. Um, this is, this is uh, an insect that is miscategorized 
as a, as a red label plug. And, and, in, that, and, and in that sense, it, it uh, triggers um, quarantine activity. So this is a quarantine issue that is being passed from, um, from, from the growers responsibility to the public sector. Now, as you've heard in New Zealand, they're totally capable of applying these same technologies at the grower level to allow them to export their products. Um, and that is where it ought to be applied. <coughs> It, it ought to be applied that way here because it is so far beyond the public realm in terms of its distribution and its uh, uh, permanent insertion into the environment that the public program cannot work. Um, we need to accept that this is an insight that is now endemic in California and, and which uh, uh, should be referred to the industry itself to apply these techniques, which will work at their level, but which cannot work um, in the uh, environment at large. And, and I think that I, that I give you this opinion from 45 years of experience as a pheromone, hormone, selective pesticide um, development specialist for the Department of Agriculture. I was director of the, of the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture's primary laboratory in Gainesville, Florida, for the development of pheromones. And, um, and, and my experience in, in that realm of time tells me we're way beyond using these techniques um, for eradication of California. Let it pass to the, to the responsible party, the effective party, the doors and sides. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman uh, Flores. Uh, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the adequacy of the draft programmatic EIR on the light brown apple moth the eradication program. My name is Tom Kelly. I'm a member of the Pesticide Watch Advisory Board and Stop the Spray Today Steering Committee. Our groups were among the many health and environmental advocacy, advocacy organizations that lobbied for an objective scientific review of the Apple Moth pro Program under the California Environmental Quality Act and submitted many, many comments uh, on this draft EIR. We've concluded that the CIR is an incomplete and inadequate analysis that is based on assumptions about the apple moth that have led the authors to unsupportable conclusions. The EIR ignores significant facts showing that the moth is not dangerous to agriculture, contends that the apple moth should be eradicated, although the CDFA has never been able to do more than control tests to pose a real danger to California agriculture, bases its conclusions on flawed assumptions and is vague about program specifics, assumes without substantive, substantive evidence that the no program alternative will cause significant health effects, especially in children. The draft EIR does not adequately evaluate the health, environmental, and food safety risks of the program. It ignores the hundreds of illness reports made after the 2007 Apple Moth aerial pesticide spray in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties, and remarkably finds that the proposed aerial ground pesticide spray causes no negative health effects. The EIR relies on flawed health and environmental studies by state agencies. One study examined only a fraction of the health complaints filed after the spray in 2007 and concluded that it, uh, quote, is not possible to determine whether or not there is a link between any of the reported symptoms and the aerial spray, end quote. Another study involved a small number of very short-term toxicity tests of only the active ingredient in the pheromone-based pesticides which bears no relation to what actual exposures will be from a multi-year spraying program. 
for the EIR to simply repeat without further analysis the state's prior carefully crafted conclusions is an egregious abdication of the purpose of EIRs under CEQA. The EIR does not evaluate the safety risks of the program as a whole. It look, instead, it looks individually at each proposed Avalon treatment, from aerial and ground pesticide spray to shooting blobs of glue laced with toxic pesticide onto trees and telephone poles, even though these treatments would be used in combination with the program. The EIR evaluates some health risks and not others. Although it finds health risks to children from a no-action alternative, it does not consider that children could pick up and eat the aerially sprayed pesticide flakes. The EIR does raise the question of how likely it is that aerial sprayed vegetables would be washed before eating, so the risks that the spray flakes might be eaten was on the author's minds. The EIR relies on a number of flawed and unsupported assumptions that many of the panel members have mentioned previously. The EIR defines the no action alternative unreasonably as entailing mass pesticide use by private landowners, even though there's no real evidence to support that scenario other than Dr. Dow's two documents uh, that have uh, neither been published nor independently reviewed. Uh, the EIR exaggerates the risk of the moth, including a recent, a recent isolated incident uh, uh, in which an unconfirmed species of moth did modest damage to a single blackberry field in Watsonville. This is the only alleged evidence of apple moth damage in California that the CDFA has produced in the past two years. And they've even uh, noted that it's difficult to determine whether or not the moths that they're, uh, and larvae that they're looking at are actually apple moths and have asked the legislature to support better, uh, I guess, funding for better DNA testing so that they can determine the identity of the moth. The EIR defines almost the entire state as a potential apple moth treatment area without offering any specifics about which treatment would be used where or how and what the impacts would be given local geography and climate. Despite repeated requests for clarification, the CDFA has never specified where aerial spraying will take place, saying only in forested and agricultural areas. Would that include the parklands adjacent to cities, such as parks in the East Bay Hills or Mount Camel Pius? How far from the uh, aerial spray uh, zones, how far will they be from populated areas? Uh, drift in the 2000 spray was detected more than three miles from the spray zone. Uh, I'll conclude with uh, two observations. Our groups appreciate that this committee is looking at the adequacy of the EIR now rather than allowing a deeply flawed and expensive process to continue unchecked. At a time when teachers are being laid off, state parks closed, and essential services cut, it makes no sense to continue spending taxpayer money on an unnecessary program. Our interest here is in imposing, in opposing a poorly conceived multi-year, multi-million dollar program of the CDFA. We are fully supportive of California farmers and recognize that they are being unfairly punished by inspections that damage their crops and requirements to use chemicals that they would not otherwise apply and by quarantines that prevent them from shipping produce that their counterparts in other countries where the moth is naturalized can freely ship to this country. I thank you for your attention and concern for this important uh, issue and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Um, any more testimony on this particular panel? We have uh, David Chapel. Um We think that the fundamental problem of this um, EIR is that it gives answers to the wrong questions. Uh, it's an EIR, EIR that's based on flawed assumptions of the, M the LBAM program, that, it's, that LBAM um, should be, in fact, an actionable pest, and that eradication is a necessary and achievable goal. As you've heard um, considerable testimony, that's very, very unlikely. What should CDFA be doing? Well, we think that it should join the California public interest groups like Citizens for Health in calling on the USDA to reclassify LBAM, to remove the requirement for emergency eradication, 
and that the federal government and persuade the federal government to treat this um, as a trade policy issue, um, as Dr. Uh, Chambers suggested. I think that the three million dollars that's being spent on this scare campaign on television, um, they're here and they're hungry, um, would be much, much better spent um, trying to push for um, push for those kinds of changes. The one issue that I haven't heard brought up here is, is the, the question of the uh, scope and the size of um, the um, light brown apple moth, uh, light brown apple moth in California. Um, some of the folks here have said that it's probably already where it's going to be. Um, there is a recent study that's been done at UC Berkeley um, that's a temperature-driven predictive model of likely distribution of elephant in California and Arizona. Um, it suggests that it may not be where um, it's predicted to be um, in this I, um, EIR, and um, that it, it suggests that its likely ecological and economic impacts would be less than previously assessed by USDA, and that its current pest status warrants reevaluation. Um, I have this um, report, and I would like to send it to the staff of this committee. Um, to whom should I send that? I'd like to add that all the quarantines are necessary. It's a quarantine in the quarantine areas have actually been expanded. Um, and as the previous speaker said, it's the quarantines themselves, um, not not Elban, that's going to be um, hurt. That is hurting agriculture right now, and is likely to continue hurting agriculture. But it's just essential that that um, that, that is stopped. And I think the CDFA can play a creative, um, out of the box role in doing that. If, if um, this um, committee and we'll just like to push them to do that. Finally, I'd just like to say that the, um, that the no action alternative that's um, been discussed here um, simply isn't supported by any evidence. And it seems to us that it is at least as likely, probably more likely, um, that a no action alternative that is truly no action uh, would result in the gradual emergence of natural predators that could um, keep L dams damaged modest at the most. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much for holding this hearing. I think it's um, terrific that the committee has decided to um, enter into this discussion early and um, to get the facts out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to... Senator Flores? Yes. If I could just... Um, I am going to be chairing my own committee meeting in two minutes, yes. or I'm going to have to leave. I would simply like to thank you very much for having this hearing. The uh, eradication proposals that have been quoted in the past have been of enormous concern to people in my district, which is a densely populated urban area that was going to have aerial spraying in the middle of the summer in the early evening when many people are outdoors. Um, I appreciated the material you provided and um, would have questions, but I do have to go and, and chair my own committee. But thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. And I hope that we can engage in a constructive dialogue with CDFA. I'm uh, disappointed that they apparently are not going to be here today. They're not. Thank, thank you, Senator. And we'll make sure we have the uh, full transcript to you. Thank you. Okay, we have a few questions, and um, uh, and the Senator Maldonado will have a few questions. Um, he always does, but somehow in the middle of this watch. <laughs> but let me uh, let me start with a couple of just basics so I can understand uh, some of the testimony. I'd like to start first with the premise, uh, and the premise, uh, at least from the testimony presented today uh, to most Californians is, very simply put, you know, is this an issue or isn't it? In other words, most of the testimony today uh, reflected, and I'll use uh, Dr. Chambers' uh, <coughs> word, that smoke and mirrors, or uh, some comments uh, by Dr. Carey, <coughs> which said that, you know, this is a resident in insect versus something that we can actually eradicate. Can you speak a little more on whether or not this is this whole process, uh, this EIR, and uh, out of the EIR, the various methods 
that are being promoted within the AIR speak to the fact that this will be treated as a resident insect. Does anything in the AIR move us in that direction? Or is this simply moving within the model of eradication? That's maybe the first threshold question I have. No, this is a uh, this is uh, right on the uh, right on the money here because the the assumption is that first that it's a serious pest and secondly that it can be eradicated. None of neither one of those uh, fundamental questions are really addressed at all. I, uh, along with two colleagues, uh, Dr. Frank Zalem and uh, National Academy of Science uh, scientist Bruce Hammond, and I last year sent a letter to uh, the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, saying exact, making those two exact points that really uh, Frank, who is a, uh, was the IPM director, statewide director at UC for 10 years, he knows this business as uh, one of the world's foremost authorities here. He views this just as another leaf roll. It's not anything to be uh, uh, that concerned about any more than any uh, of the ones that are uh, currently resident. And um, so uh, I defer to him and uh, he uh, uh, believes that. And then also, uh, regarding the eradication, uh, I come back to the comments that were made about the uh, technical advisory committee. I know a few of these people, and uh, or actually most of them, and uh, not only, not speaking for them, but the general uh, consensus in the entire uh, entomological community is that this uh, pest cannot be eradicated. It's not even a close call, and it just seems uh, it's uh, puzzling why uh, they are going forward with this. I mean, it's not puzzling in a political sense, but certainly biologically. This is simply uh, unrealistic. Yeah. And it's, it's not addressed in this yet. And the, the, the reason you say that, I assume, is that within 2,300 square miles in 15 counties, the Arbor had a trap up in one of the counties that you know, we haven't found it in yet. If I would put up hundreds of traps, I bet I would find it. So no, in other words, it's kind of, uh, I think it's uh, said, you know, the more trash you put out, uh, the more likely you're to find with some sense that this is a growing problem because if you put more traps out, you find more. I guess it's the assumption. Right? That's right. But, but also the analogy I use is that this is, uh, and it's obviously an appropriate one, that is that this is a cancer-like process. And so you're not eradicating a an elephant population, you're uh, trying to eradicate uh, a million of these, because every little metastasis can regenerate the population. So anything short of 100% effectiveness is really control and not uh, eradication. That's even in concept the difficulty with eradication. I think I think that's also something that's important for. Uh, yeah. Can identify yourself right before you speak. That helps with the transfer. Roy Upton. Um, I think there's something that's very important for this committee to understand is when this program first started. Um, you could say, honestly, that there may have been a scientific basis for implementing the program. LBAM was on a list, USDA, CDFA believed at that time that it was a pest of economic significance. So I give them credit for that. They moved, they moved very fast. Um, and as these experts would tell you, they often move on programs before science. So they don't get the science in because they don't feel they have the time in order to attack the pest at its early stage. So I give them credit for that. Um, but now this is two, three, two and a half years later. We have had a chance to look at the science. Only they've dug their heels into a program that now no longer has scientific support. Um, when they sprayed Santa Cruz and Monterey, they never asked their technical working group, uh, is this a feasible strategy? The technical working group, all they said originally was that aerial spraying may be part of an effective eradication program. And then CDFA moved ahead as their sole eradication tool, which Dr. Chambers will tell you very clearly that pheromones were never developed to be an eradication tool, to control tool. So they've dug their heels on a program that they once thought had value, and now they have, I believe they have to defend that position. I think that's the very first thing that we have. This committee should understand the history of it. Um, and now that we have two years or three years of looking at the science, it's just no longer supported. Dana Harder. We also have the advantage of looking at places where Lycron Akamoth have arrived as an invader. Uh, New Zealand and Hawaii, where it's been there for over a century. And we know it's been here in California, and we know how, how it's been controlled in New Zealand by, to very high levels by parasites that will lay eggs in the larvae or will take advantage of the different life forms and, 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 and use them as a food source. 
And um, since we had this precedent in, in New Zealand and I visited there and talked to the people, I started looking at parasites. So I started gathering larvae as I saw them in the collections at the, at the Arboretum and raising them out in, in jars and found that over 200 larvae that I've raised over the last three years, 90% uh, of them have been infected by a wasp or a fly or a, and other things. And by me removing that larvae from that plant, I'm also preventing it and, uh, from being eaten by birds and uh, wasps and other things that predate on, will, will actually predate on it. And we know from a study that was funded by CDFA from a researcher at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, that there are seven parasites that affect Lycron Appomoth in California, and over 70 different things will take, use it as a food source. So we know that it's been here long enough to establish a relationship with these parasitic wasps, which have simply seen Lycron Appomoth larvae as similar larvae to what they've laid eggs in before. And we find that Lycron Appomoth and this study showed that, that Lycron Appomoth is, is parasitized to higher levels than our native leaf rollers. So there is actually enhanced control of this invaded uh, moth in California that over what we have in controls of our own natives, which are not a source of um, problems in agriculture, nor are they a focus on eradication. Mm -hmm. well, uh, maybe just another question on the, um, the CDFA's decision to move to EIR, and the reason for that, again, was a court. Is this, is this the, so in other words, if we had not had a court decision, what would CDFA be doing at this point in time? Do you have any speculation? Uh, Roy Upton, um, I live in SoCal, which is right outside Santa Cruz, and so was involved in the beginning, and, uh, and had they um, obviated the EIR process, which is typically mandated by law, um, under the declaration of emergency that was given to them, or that they actually declared themselves. Um, they were brought to court, uh, both in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties, and both courts ruled that CDFA or USDA, neither CDFA nor USDA provided any evidence that any emergency existed. And therefore, they did not have any right to um, negate the EIR. And so therefore, before they were to implement um, aerial spraying again, they needed to do the EIR. And then I expect, uh, because of the massive opposition to aerial spraying California-wide, they knew they couldn't go back to that, so they moved to sterile insect release as their primary eradication tool. And, and so, CDFA now is on this path that their due date as soon as September 28th for closure of this, and then they're going to make a decision based on the amount of comment that has been produced. Has this been the process for the way we deal with eradication programs in the past at CDFA? I know they're not here. One of the questions we're going to ask them, but is this, we go out and ask to poll folks and, and, and ask them, you know, give us your comments, but yet we're still going to be the decision makers in this. And I assume it you know, has been some mention of Mr. Dahl's writing of a memo at the beginning of the process. I assume he'll be part parcel of making a decision uh, on this, and that, is this yet or even the, the, the crest has been looked at from a peer review perspective, someone looking at this going out? So I have a lot of questions, but maybe we first start with, is this the way we normally do these types of programs? I can only speak to the Durham Chamber again. I was, because uh, I was chairman of the uh, Truth Flight Science Advisory Panels, I was always involved in, in the process of, uh, of implementing a new project. And this has never happened. This has never happened. Um, there seemed to be freedom to, to proceed without, uh, without much political input. There's also a lot of public input. I've been screamed at by lots of people that didn't want to be sprayed from the fire. But um, and we got past that. But I want to give you a couple of other examples of what will happen. Um, because of, because this is so broadly spread. Once they start um, using either pheromone or sterile insects, they immediately become blind. Um, the the pheromone that they will apply in order to confuse the male's uh, ability to find females is the same pheromone as used in the trap. So they can't find the trap. 
Uh, and secondly, once you release a lot of sterile insects, uh, you're, you're involved in a huge problem of sorting the sterile moths uh, from those that are not. Um, and, and, and these have historically been programs that are extremely vulnerable to, to, the, to the failures of implementation that are human and that are technical. And there's not a single sterile insect technique uh, application that has not failed. Maybe multiple times. It had to be restarted and reinstituted, or the rearing had to be moved, or a new technique had to be applied. Uh, and finally, my example wants, uh, is, is again uh, a medfly example. Um, as I mentioned, the, the issue was quarantine. They wanted to move product out of California to, to to uh, countries that you know, quarantine that don't have that fly. So, so uh, implemented a program in Los Angeles. So the whole of the LA basin is being uh, covered with sterile insects. That's not uh, an eradication program. Uh, that is a permanent program 